Ministers. Uh, we move on now to questions to the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure. Members, question 10 and 13 have been withdrawn. And we begin with the topical questions. And I call Mr Craig. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As the Minister will well know, um, Lisburn got the accolade of European City of Sport this year. And we're rightfully proud of all the sporting organisations within the city. Could the Minister outline what additional support is planned for some of those sporting organisations within the city this year? Um, I thank the member for his question. Um, certainly, in relation to there's currently a bid process uh, seeing the Lisburn Rackets Club receive an additional money. There has been additional money uh, for Salto Gym through the governing body for gymnastics. Uh, I have had approaches and certainly be looking at opportunities around soccer and boxing and other sports as well. Um, and just to say to the, the member, I mean, certainly uh, attracting the Chinese male gymnast team first, ranked first in the world, to Lisbon is no mean feat. I have absolutely no doubt that Lisbon will be banking on that in order to attract additional investment in the future. Well, Mr Jonathan Craig for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, with regard to Salto, um, it is recognised that they pulled off, I suppose, what is one of the key achievements in the Olympic Games, and that is getting the uh, Chinese gymnasts there. Uh, unfortunately, Salto is a victim of its own success and it's bursting at the seams and has plans to develop that uh, facility further. Will the Minister and her department be supportive of that extension, which can only benefit all the people of Northern Ireland further than Lisburn itself? Thank you. I mean, the member is right in saying that the facilities, certainly at Salto, are an exemplar uh, indeed across this island when it comes to gymnastics. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to meet uh, the representative of Salto Gym with the member, and certainly members of Decon Sport NI, to look at uh, potential expansion um, of the facilities at Salto. Uh, as yet, there hasn't been any request to do that, but certainly I'm anticipating one, because I haven't been at the gym on several occasions, and it has been uh, flagged up to me that they have a witness that they can't facilitate, uh, and they're not happy to be in that situation, but certainly uh, happy to meet with the member and the delegation from the gym to see what we can do in the future. Uh, at the beginning, I informed members that questions 10 and 13 had been withdrawn. That refers, of course, to the oral questions. Question 6 has been withdrawn in the topicals. And I move on to Mr Raymond McCartney. Uh, me, good. Uh, I'll ask him, Clara, can, I, can I ask the minister if she would confirm that the, the City of Culture legacy plan will be brought forward this year, and can she further confirm that Derry City Football Club will be included in the uh, AFA sub-regional development of stadium? There is certainly a, a local theme of local politics emerging in topical questions, and I appreciate that all politics is local. First of all, uh, I mean, we, we were very successful in securing an additional £2 million um, as part of the monitoring rounds for uh, the, the City of Culture's legacy uh, fund. It is really important that, particularly when you're looking at the legacy, and there has been much in the media about the legacy, but for us, you know, the entire executive 3D call, our focus has always been on addressing opportunities, and there's no better opportunity than you know, tackling poverty and social exclusion. I'm, and I'm happy uh, that that will happen. Um, in terms of uh, other uh, facilities, uh, namely the, the Brandywell and the showgrounds and the rest, as part of that legacy. I mean, certainly they'll be included in that. But what I would, would like to see certainly is we're working with the Council on the production of a robust legacy plan. We'll be bringing our own in addition to that. And I've no doubt I'll be hearing right up until the last minute from the people of the city and surrounding communities about what they'd like to see invested. <coughs> Call Mr. McCartney for supplementary, and I would encourage the member to ask only one, one question. question. Well spotted, uh, last concluder. Uh, uh, can, first of all, can I thank the minister for her answer? Indeed, I'll, I'll ask her one question. We heard this morning, and the minister has alluded that the, the executive has now, through DECAL, 
uh, ring fence £2 million for the uh, le legacy pro uh, process. Can she confirm today how that will be used and, in particular, how it will advance the Brandywell and Foyle Valley Master Plan? Valley Master Plan, not just with the £2 million from DECAL, but certainly with the £3 million that the Derry City Council has, will certainly put a core dent, as we say in Belfast, into the Foyle Valley Plan and help address one of the legacy projects that have been flagged up in the city. It is really important that we use opportunities through sport and physical activity, through the arts, through community development, mm -hmm. through health, social development and the rest, to make sure that we leave a good footprint. And I believe that the, the Foyle Valley project is one of those and looking forward to seeing heart rolled out in the future. Call Mr David Hildes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, what well, post a great weekend for, for boxing here in Northern Ireland, Belfast in particular. I'm sure you'll congratulate, obviously, Carl Frampton as he, as he heads on to greater things. But the deadline has recently passed for a tranche of funding that became available for, for local boxing clubs. I just asked the Minister, uh, in her opinion, was there a good uptake or is she content with the uptake of uh, clubs? Um, there, there, first of all, I would like to concur with the, the members. Uh, statement around Carl Frampton and all the other boxers who succeeded at the weekend. I believe the, uh, the, the wins that they all achieved and the support that they had from right across the community is probably unprecedented and it's something that many other sports can learn from. The, the, there was a huge uptake uh, and certainly uh, I haven't got the figures with me at the minute but it will come as no surprise to the member that the, the demand far outweighs the, the funds that we have, so we need to look at ways in which supporting that. But certainly the uptake has been huge. And as a member and other members, I'm sure, who will raise this today will know that the state of facilities and boxing clubs are probably the worst for sports across. <coughs> and we aim to make sure that we're, not only do we invest in making sure that those facilities are fit for purpose, but all others have an opportunity, all other departments and bodies have an opportunity to contribute, and that includes some of local government. Uh, there have been some councils have done great work. Other councils are expressing interest, and I'm keen to make sure that this deadline isn't a cut-off uh, for boxing forevermore. We just need to see what money we'll have to try and meet the need. Well, Mr Hildes, first supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for the answer so far. Now, now that the deadline's passed and we're, we're in a period of, of assessment, when does the Minister expect to see delivery on the ground? Well, certainly in terms of some of the minor capital equipment, you know, like uh, uh, head guards and bags and things like that. I mean, most of, most of the clubs, if not all, have, would have received those. The assessments, the technical assessments in terms of capital needs, um, I would anticipate by Christmas 2015, December 2015, that work, a lot of the work would, would not only have commenced well underway, but some of which would be near completion. Um, but I am still hopeful that even at this late stage that not only were uh, city councils have boxing clubs and there are either also helping them and maybe contributing some of the funding to look at a better way in which we can have some of these much needed facilities delivered. Call Mr Pat Ramsey for a question. Thank you Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Could I ask the Minister to outline to the House what process she would envisage going forward that outside the three main sporting bodies that on a sub-regional basis sporting clubs could take advantage of modernisation and improvement programmes? Well, um, certainly, as the member will be aware, that the IFA have uh, the sub-regional uh, facilities and that the, the, they're in the process uh, of looking at a facilities development plan. Um, I mean, that will be completed and will be presented to me, and certainly, you know, based on what's there, I make a final decision at the end. But it is really important to make sure that uh, local clubs, be they small or big, have themselves in a state of readiness. And as a member, will also be aware that not everybody who puts a plan for will get funded. Mr. Ramsey, for supplement. Yeah, and I thank the minister for her response. Could I then further ask her? Could the minister give this house the fullest assurance that Derry City Football Club will not be disadvantaged by playing the League of Ireland, and they will become part of a funding stream? through this present comprehensive spending review period? Well, I know the member is aware of the response I give to his foil um, colleague, Raymond McCartney, in terms of we've already uh, submitted £2 million to go towards the Daisy Fields and the Showgrounds as part of the overall Foyle Valley programme. 
Uh, the Derry City Football Club, along with many other football clubs, have been and will continue to meet with the IFA to make sure that their facilities are certainly on the list to bring forward for approval. Well, Mr. Cahill Washing for a question. Uh, can the Minister confirm that the NI events investigation is complete, um, when it will be published, and do the Department intend to reinstall any of the events within that? Um, the Member will be aware uh, that the um, events company was transferred to Daddy in April 2010, um, and, and at the minute there, there is a report to be compiled um, on the findings of that investigation. Uh, basically, uh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the, the events company has been transferred to Daddy, along with Daddy and the tourist board. Certainly, there's events here that collectively across the executive that we need to look at, but no, no better than this year as an example of what we can do in terms of world stage events. But I would like to see uh, the conclusion of this investigation and the report published. Call Mr. Washington for a supplement. Uh, can the Minister um, also tell me or assure me that uh, those events will happen right across the north uh, rather than just in the two main cities? Um, no, well, what I can do is, um, I mean, certainly, particularly from areas outside of Belfast and, and, and Derry City, that um, a lot of people are concerned that there are events and the potential of events and certainly the impact will have on tourism and indeed the local economy need to be given an opportunity. Uh, what I would say to people who have that concern is there's absolutely nothing stopping people bringing forward projects now. But equally, I'd like to see the uh, publication of the report to make sure that lessons that need to be learned have been learned and opportunities that we collectively need to bring forward that we can do so collectively. As pointed out at the beginning, question six has been withdrawn. Uh, Mr. Declan McAleer is not in his place, Mr. Alex Atwood is not in his place, Mr. Datty Mackay is not in his place, and Mr. Ian McRae is in his place. Indeed, wasn't expecting that, but nonetheless, um, the Minister will be aware that the Northern Ireland Pipe Band scene has had very good results in, in this. Um, um, piping season. Can the Minister comment on, on how she feels that that can further um, be attributed to throughout next season? I am delighted the member was in his place, um, but he, he asked a very valid question and actually provides something that certainly in terms of pipe bands and some of the pipe bands that I visited and were witness to this year have enjoyed a lot of success and rightly so it hasn't came without a lot of hard work and I have no doubt that success will be continued next year and I have absolutely no doubt that our department, even through DECAL Arts Council and the Ulster Scots Agency, will, will play their part in ensuring that that success is realised. That concludes the... Oh, my apologies, Ian. <laughs> you have a supplementary. That's the least we... I, I, I think so. Um... <laughs> Will the Minister uh, join with me in congratulating a young fellow, um, Matthew Wenlock, who this weekend um, became the world champion in his, um, I think it's the, if I get it correct, it was the um, World um, Solo Drumming Championships, and I think it was his, the under-16 level. So will she join with me in congratulating him? Of course, so I'll join with you in congratulating him. Um, and indeed, you know, the, the, these competitions have not just an opportunity for people to compete, but also to, to excel and actually try and improve on their skills and move from one category to another. Uh, I mean, anybody, and I admire anybody who plays a musical instrument, regardless of they're in a pipe band, marching band, pop band, traditional band, it's, it's absolutely no mean feat. But I would like to extend my congratulations to Matthew and hope to make sure that he and others succeed next year. Members, that concludes topical questions. We may now move on to oral questions. And as previously pointed out, questions 10 and 13 have been withdrawn. And I call Ms Joanne Dobson. Ms Dobson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number one. I thank the member for her question. Library's NI strategy for delivering... Uh, increases in labour usage is set out in its 2013-2014 business plan. 
Libraries NI will measure participation in a wide range of activities and events and programmes, as well as book usage, uh, library membership and others, due to an incomplete data set within Libraries' 10-year-old Elfney computer system. It is not possible to identify with sufficient cer certainty the changes in the usage in areas where libraries have been closed. The introduction of libraries' new computer system E2 over the coming year will provide, amongst many improvements, a complete postcode data set for the analysis of library usage in the future. Call Ms. Dobson for supplementary. Thank you again, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister will agree with me that libraries play an essential role in our local communities, and she is in record as disagreeing with library closures under the previous Culture Minister. So, can I ask, does she therefore plan to reprofile spending within her department to build up these vital services again, including Guildford in my own constituency? Um, maybe the member is not aware. I'm happy to furnish her with the figures, but I have reprofiled the budget across all the ALBs to ensure that libraries had additional money. Not only that, um, but make sure that some of the libraries who some of the proposals were to reduce opening hours we try to balance it out to make sure that library closures were totally avoided. So I'm happy to provide that, those statistics to the member. In terms of Guildford, uh, I mean, I'm aware that there has been great lengths that have been went to, particularly around working with the community uh, group in, in Guildford, and also to, to, well, it's the local community development group, to make sure that every opportunity for better library usage in that area is available. Often I've seen mother and toddlers, uh, job skills, uh, and other supports that the libraries have given right across the board, particularly in rural areas. But I am keen to make sure libraries can only be sustained where there is proper usage. So anything that the member and others can do to make sure that our libraries are not only protected, but the usage increases, I would really welcome that. Call Ms. Karen McKevitt. Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Given that Libraries NI have invested uh, heavily in the mobile units, um, can I ask the Minister, um, has there been an increase in the areas uh, um, for the mobile units in areas where libraries have had closures um, in order to facilitate um, the library users using the new E2 programme? Um, well, I mean, as I said to Mr Wan Dobson, that we have not got exact data of any increase of usage or even any profile or complexion of library usage through mobile, given areas where libraries were closed. Uh, and as a member will be aware, there was uh, a, a stage one review into mobile or proposed into the mobile services. But what I can say is anecdotal evidence is that there is greater use of mobile services. E2 will be coming on board next year, which we anticipate an even increased usage, and particularly helping people who have to pay it and who are isolated to make sure that we bring the library to them as much as possible. But it is important to make sure that people who are really, really committed to their libraries have every opportunity to make sure that they have a service in their area. Call Mr Ian McCrae. Um, the Minister can correct me if I picked her up wrong, but I, I think she said there was no um, data available in respect of the mobile libraries. Is the Minister not concerned that that is not the case? given the fact that a lot of the figures are based on usage of, or lack of usage of um, libraries and the, the promotion of the usage of mobile libraries? It's, and certainly in terms of numbers, um, there, is, there are figures there, but in terms of breakdowns by postcode, then breakdowns by people's gender, if they have dependents, if they have children, their, their background, that data isn't available. I mean, the system that they are using at the moment is well over 10 years old. It is not fit for purpose. That is why E2 has been brought in and procured, and it will provide the kind of breakdown that we need, you know, just in terms of future-proofing stock, what type of stock you buy, you know, how many people need Kindles, all that sort of thing. We have not got the detail. I certainly have details in terms of how many people are using mobile libraries at the minute, where the demand is for future use and all the rest. Um, but I think the key thing is to make sure that people um, have not only their membership of their local library, but and continue to use their local library and also encourage others to do it. Because certainly libraries who haven't been used and can't be sustained are certainly those who are going to be harder to sustain in the future. It's me of McLaughlin. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? Um, could I ask the Minister maybe to provide an update on the, the seven libraries that were originally identified for closure? 
Um, well, certainly a lot of progress has been made, and uh, tribute to Libraries, uh, NI, and their board and their staff for that. Uh, I mean, the member may be aware, certainly, uh, of the new library in Draper's Town, the partnership with the local community association that has now been saved and it's opened, and that is one model, particularly in rural areas, that we'll have to look at. And there are also advanced plans to improve facilities, both at Carnlock and Kelly Lay. Um, I mean, at the quarterly meetings, uh, certainly, and as I said, a result of a lot of hard work, just on the 17th last week, all the remaining seven libraries are currently sustainable and should remain open, uh, that were earmarked for potential closer, closure. The only caveat I would have on this is that a further review on viability will take place only in Kelly Lay and Greystones Library, as the level of usage in these libraries, while you know, still looks sustainable, continues to be a concern. And unless that sustainability improves and the numbers and the usage improves, we're going to come back to a situation where libraries aren't going to be seen or deemed as viable unless we have you know, more people accessing the services and creating a demand. Mr Declan McAleer is not in his place. I move on to Mr Peter Weir. Uh, question number three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Since my last update, um, which I think was, yeah, it was in May this year, Sport and I, in conjunction with the Irish Amateur Boxing Association, has selected four suppliers to provide boxing equipment to clubs, and an independent technical team was appointed to carry out surveys of boxing clubs' premises where there is a need for capital works. To date, 166,000 has been allocated to the provision of equipment, which has currently been issued to clubs, and delivery of such equipment will be, will be complete to all clubs. It is anticipated by the end of the year. The independent technical team has so far completed 65, sur 65 surveys uh, on site, uh, of which 26 survey reports have been submitted to Sport NI so far for consideration, and those others will be ongoing. And subsequently, a call for formal applications for capital awards was made on the 10th of September. Uh, and uh, the member will be aware that the IABA club development manager has been holding one-to-one -one meetings with some of the clubs. And also, the member may also be aware that a number of uh, district councils have also been proactive in identifying premises uh, that, that could be used to accommodate boxing clubs. Mr. Weir, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for her answer. Can I ask the Minister, in light of the, the need to maximise the value of spend for boxing to ensure it gets the most out of this, and also in light of particularly the concentration of clubs, particularly in Belfast, um, what actions is the Department taking to ensure? Uh, or to try to encourage sharing of facilities and also to ensure that uh, venues are identified of underused facilities that are either within central government or local government control? Um, well, first of all, I think the member is right. There are huge uh, challenges for us in trying to meet the need within boxing clubs. And certainly some of the local councils have been excellent in trying to provide some of the underused facilities that they have under their control and try and meet it, meet it up with, the, with identified need, particularly in terms of boxing. But not all city councils are, or, sorry, uh, councils are involved in this, and I would encourage the members, own council and others, to come involved because I think it's a valuable exercise. I think there's huge opportunities, particularly in front of RPA and all the changes and challenges that will bring with it. I have no register in terms of central government, what uh, facilities they may have. Uh, I'm certainly keen to find out if there are any and how they can be used, if at all. Mr. Kahlawashi. Thanks for embrace the Naira. That's in the for uh, Could I ask the Minister uh, what assistance was given to boxing clubs uh, to avail uh, to the maximum of the boxing investment strategy? Um, well, a as I said to uh, the previous member, um, a club manager from the Irish Amateur Boxing Association has met with a lot of boxing clubs, supported by Sport NI as well. Um, and they have been working with clubs on a one to, range of one to one issues, ensuring, for example, that there's small equipment that they've availed of that, but also to look at other needs in terms of making sure that they have maybe a funding <coughs> strategy, making sure that the process around assessment on the capital, the bigger capital needs of the clubs. And to try and give them advice. Um, 
And I, I, mean, I believe that this has been uh, a welcomed assistance. I mean, the feedback I've had from most of the clubs that they value this one-to-one -one because I felt that that was probably one of the gaps. Uh, but certainly, as I said again as well, I think there are still huge opportunities, particularly with local government and this investment into boxing, to try and yield better results for a sport that hasn't really, despite the success and despite given the weekend that we had in terms of boxing, certainly have facilities that aren't fit for purpose. Well, Mr. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her response to date. Given an acknowledgement that boxing clubs across Northern Ireland had the key elements of the programme for government in terms of greater participation in sport, has the Minister been able to ascertain how many boxing clubs we have and how many of them are in need of urgent modernisation programmes? Um, well, there's well over 60 boxing clubs across the north. Um, and, you know, it would be fair to say that many of them, if not all, well, certainly I would say the majority of them would need some support around capital, and it goes from some support to a lot of support. I think you could count in one hand the number of clubs who don't need any support at all out of those 60 odds. Uh, and despite, you know, uh, it's not the wax lyrical here, but we continually praise the work and the product of boxers in this assembly and this chamber. We continue to acknowledge the commitment and work and the role models to play for children and young people within our communities. We have to really get behind the sport and making sure that not only do they have the facilities that are fit for purpose, but they'll also attract other youngsters to the sport because any parent walking in Despite the success and despite what the boxing community have done for our communities and our families, the walk in see some of the facilities, I could not blame some of them for being tempted to walk back out again, despite all that they do. So we really need to get behind the sport and put the investment where it is needed, and boxing is one of those sports that needs it. Mr Michael McJimsey. Deputy Speaker, does the Minister believe, in terms of her boxing strategy, that a facilitation process between Sandy Row Boxing Club and boxing authorities uh, will result in uh, the club and wider community having the confidence to go forward uh, with their strategy, believing and certain that they will be free from sectarian and racial abuse? Well, I am waiting on the report coming back from the independent panel tonight, and I am glad that Sandy Row met with that panel. Uh, I am not too sure how many times I met, but I, I believe that the, the discussions were robust, and I believe that certainly that there is a desire to try and make sure that the youngsters who are involved, albeit in a dwindling numbers, in Sandy Row have opportunities like the rest. In terms of sectarianism and sport, I condemn it regardless of where it happens, absolutely and utterly and unequivocally. And I have to say, and the member knows this, and he knows it in his heart, that of all the sports, boxing has had the least complaints. But where it happens, it happens once too often. Now, I'd like Sandy Row to be involved in this. I'd like him to move forward and use every opportunity to come, become available and get the facilities that not only their club need, but the people of South Belfast deserve. Mr. Phil Flanagan for a question. I get the last question call you, Keisha, for Keisha. Question number four. I thank the member for his question. Work on Waterways Ireland on the restoration of the, the Ulster Canal has been solely focused on the section from Upper Loch Erne to Clonus. The project will be advanced in line with available resources. The Ulster Canal Interagency Group has been tasked to examine all possible options for financing the project, and DECAL's economists are now reviewing the business case to update the estimate of costs and identify social as well as economic benefits for the, the first section of the canal. The Ulster Canal Interagency Group is currently exploring EU funding options with the Special European Union Programmes Body, SEUPB. Mr Flanagan for a supplementary. Thank the, the Minister for her answer. Um, I welcome the continuing commitment from the Minister to the, the Ulster Canal, particularly from Upper Locker and to Clonus. But um, one of the difficulties it faces is an, an absence of, of funding. So, could the Minister give us more information on potential funding options for completing that section of the canal? Well, certainly looking at ways in which we could, uh, I mean, the, inter the work of the interagency primarily is to look not just at the funding options, but what we can do with around current or available funding that we have at the minute. It is really important that we look at the Ulster Canal in terms of how we can open up waterways, how can we improve tourism, how can we, we improve the local economy, and even with the restoration of uh, Ulster, the Ulster Canal in this area where it has, been, it has experienced uh, a, a lack of investment, 
uh, for, for decades. It would be really, really important we get this started. So we're looking not just within uh, the Irish government, certainly within DECAL, also looking at Europe and certainly looking at other opportunities, possibly through the Lottery, Lottery Heritage Fund and many others, to see if we can get this started and try and get, the, get it started in such a way that we can, rather than wait until all the money is in, look at options about bringing it forward. But we can only do that on the basis of secured funding. And once that happens, I'd be happy to bring a statement back to the House, but certainly happy to bring to the member um, and other members for that area a bit of good news I've been waiting on for a long time. Mr. Tom Elliott. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that update. Uh, can the Minister inform us how much the overall project was estimated to cost from the business case, and indeed what the expected income, uh, projected income from the, the project would be in the business case? Well, I mean, the overall is going into you know, tens of millions of pounds, and the business case, I believe, needs updated, and that will be part of discussions with myself and Minister Deanahan and Minister McGinley about looking at I mean, some of the work that we are doing within DECAL, within our own economists, is bringing up a, a, a fresh approach to the economic appraisal, sharing it with our colleagues in the Irish Government and sharing it with the interagency group, because I believe that rather than waiting on all the money being secured at once, we need to look at the potential for phased approaches. And, you know, good news that we've now got full plan permission across all the councils and certainly from our planning service here. We, now, we, I believe, now need to look at what capital monies are available, what we can do and what our plan is to try and secure additional funds for that area. As I said to Phil Flanagan, it's really, really important, and I'm sure the member is more aware of this than me, that we get parts of that canal opened and try and get some construction work into it. Well, Mr Joe Byrne. Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if this issue can be raised at the next meeting of the North South Ministerial Council and what potential does she expect that could accrue to the areas of Fermanagh and Tyrone in terms of tourism going forward? Well, uh, the Member should be comforted by knowing that this uh, is always raised at the North South Ministerial Council and certainly within the waterways uh, sectoral aspect of decals, North South arrangements, it is constantly brought up. I think the key here is to look at certainly in terms of the, the rural communities, what we can do now. Look to see what monies are available. I appreciate when the Irish Government said that they would fully fund this project. They were in different economic circumstances. However, they still remain committed to doing something. So the work that, that I'm trying to do within DECOG to look at a, a new economic appraisal to see what the real costs are, to see what parts of the work that maybe I could start and maybe uh, in conjunction with Ministers uh, Dean and McGinley to try and get this started. I think you know, there's an awful lot of expectation around this project, and rightly so, but no more for the people who live and work in that surrounding area and for the people who live in that area who are waiting and work for the restoration of this canal. Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, parts of the UK and many other countries have suddenly reinvented Kenneos as uh, tourist uh, facilities and attractions. What lessons uh, does the Minister intend to, intends to adopt um, you know, from other people's experiences? Certainly, um, I mean, the reports we receive on a regular basis from Waterways Ireland in terms of tourist potential, even just looking at the Royal Canal uh, and the potential that it has brought, even at like, festivals across all the canals and waterways, the length and breadth of this island, unfortunately, or some of the very few opportunities that rural dwellers and people living in rural communities around waterways have of you know, generating the local economy. So the tourist uh, potential is absolutely huge. And not only that, it's not huge just for people who live in this island, for huge for people who want to come <coughs> here, visit and travel. There is big, big interest, particularly in Europe, around canals and waterways. And I think it's, you know, it's incumbent upon us to try and do whatever we can to get this project financed. Albeit we need to make a start on it, and albeit we haven't got all the funds yet, but I believe it's time we need to make a start on it rather than sitting waiting on the free money coming. Because people who are looking for tourists, who have a tourist product to offer, people who are willing to, and able to work, are looking at us for opportunities to get this moving, and I think that's what I could do. Well, Mr. Gordon Dunn for a question. question number five, please, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the member, uh, I have not. I thank the member for his question. And up, up until you know, yesterday, I haven't received any requests from any individual or group or organisation to discuss the development of a purpose-built motorsports track facility 
I am committed to sustaining motorsport here, and I recently met with Ministers Kennedy and Foster to explore opportunities around safety in motorsport and continue funding for motorsport in the future years. And it's through partnership and collaborative working that DECAL will ensure that positive outcomes will continue to be delivered for motorsport. And moreover, DECAL's interest in road racing remains focused on encouraging the sport to improve safety of competitors and spectators. Mr. Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Does the Minister recognise the need for such a provision, considering the huge interest there is in motorsport in Northern Ireland and the need to reduce uh, the risk, especially for road racing and motorbikes, and increase the safety of spectators at, at motorsport events? And further, does the Minister uh, has she considered the Mays site, perhaps, as an option for such a motorsport facility? I think it would be an, an excellent facility and an excellent site. Um, well, first of all, I haven't received any facilities uh, development strategy from the governing body, which two and four wheels, as a member, will know. Um, and it's on the basis of the governing bodies bringing forward the strategies that we, the department through sport and I either agree to give funding or we don't. Um, I haven't, so on the basis that I haven't looked at any site because uh, the, the two and four weeks haven't even revisited their current facilities plan uh, on the basis that uh, they haven't asked for me to assess the need for a purpose-built facility standalone for motorsport. Quite happy with the three outlets that they have at the minute. Um, so, I mean, on the basis of that, I, have, I have, haven't given any thought to purpose-built facilities, and I'm not really too sure that the governing body has either. I have met with them recently, and they didn't present that to me as something they wish to take forward. Call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister mentions the two and four wheels, and she also mentioned investment. But the current Sports Matters strategy outlines that there is a potential for greater private investment into the bagging of increased demand for motorsport to build a new facility. Is the Minister looking into that at all? The short answer is no. Uh, investment will certainly be in terms of the performance of the athletes involved, certainly the performance uh, and work around the governing body and improvements that they have to make. And I mean, that, that investment will continue. But as a standalone facility, um, I am sensing that there is a bit of a lobby coming on, but the governing body actually have not spoken to me about it, uh, and they would have had an opportunity to do so. Certainly, would like maybe additional improvements on the current facilities that they have at the moment, but haven't actually brought forward a standalone uh, motorsports facility. I call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Can the minister tell us uh, how would the funding the funding provided by Sports NI to two and four wheel vehicles uh, under its performance focus program assist the development of the sport? Um, well, it certainly looks at encouraging, um, the, under the performance focus programme, Sport NI um, has agreed for over £300,000 over the period of 2013 to 2017 with the for the development of the motorsport across the north. And they have identified a number of priorities. Uh, I mean, they include modernisation of the sport. But particularly around development around performance and talent and coaching would be their priorities. Um, and they've, adempt, they've also identified uh, the need for a full time development manager and high performance coaching officer. Um, and that, that certainly would be one way or several ways in which uh, the investment from DECAL to Sport and I can go to two and four ways to help their, their, their performance and their, indeed their focus, focus for future development of facilities. Call Mr. Jim Allister for a question. I thank the member for his question. DECAL is committed to ensuring that it fulfils its duties under the ENI Act 1998 in relation to the promotion of equality and opportunity and good relations. Sport, arts and creativity and linguistic diversity make a valuable contribution to good relations and the creation of a shared and better future. One example of this is a cultural awareness strategy. The implementation of the strategy has seen the Ulster Council of the GAA and the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland engage in positive dialogue to deliver joint relations events in March of this year at McGee Campus in Derry. 
and plans for a second Good Relations event are well underway. Derry City Council and the City of Culture programme included the tattoo, the FLA, and successfully included and celebrated with the whole community, and I was there myself to see both hand. Um, the organisers work, organisers work with the community and with, within the city to include Irish, Ulster Scots and minority community traditions. As well as that, the Leafa initiative makes Irish accessible to people from every background. The Irish language belongs to us all and is a vital part of our shared cultural heritage. Forrest Nagel funds an Irish language officer post in the East Belfast mission and DECAL officials have met with a mission to discuss how we can assist with their work. The agencies of the North-South Language Body have undertaken joint projects in Irish and Ulster Scots communities. The agencies delivered showcase events to coincide with the Olympic torch relay. The Young Ambassadors Programme involved eight young people from USA and Canada. The Arts Council's Reimaging Communities Programme between 2005 and 2011 invested over £3.3 million and 155 projects, transforming communities by removing images and replacing them with more positive images that reflect the views of all the community. The Irish Football Association, through its Football for All cam campaign, has introduced measures to address sectarianism in soccer. An IFA Community Relations Department has been established and a Community Relations Officer appointed to work with clubs and officials and supporters has happened. The Intercultural and Arts Strategy so. creates avenues for minority ethnic communities to access arts and participate in them. The strategy uses arts to develop community cohesion, increase awareness of diversity, develop good relations, tackle racism, and a total of £300,000 from lottery funding has committed to this programme over the next three years. After that very comprehensive question or answer, I wonder does the member have a supplementary? Get a comprehensive one. <laughs> As Her Majesty's Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure in Northern Ireland, and as the Minister is a Minister of the Crown on a 24-7 basis, uh, and therefore subject to the constraints and obligations of the Ministerial Code at all times, why then this summer did she see fit to align herself with partisan protests against expressions of British culture in Northern Ireland and be present on several occasions order, please. when such order, uh, please. matters took place. Order, please. I'll ask the member to sit down if he doesn't ask a question that relates to the previous one. With respect, asking if she's subject to the ministerial code why during the summer she didn't abide by it and instead seat, engaged please. in partisan actions is very pertinent to the question. Um, as I have consistently said, that the member is consistently silly. Uh, he provides nothing but divisive politics to this House. He has done absolutely nothing in terms of community relations, building good or better relations and reconciliation. I think he has an absolute brass neck to question my adherence to the ministerial code, uh, which is, belongs to this place. So the member, despite all his expertise alleged uh, of non standing orders inside out, needs to ask the right question, which is factually right and pertinent to the question he asked in the first place. If he has any difficulty with doing so, I'm quite happy to sit down with him and show him how it's done. Call Mr well done, Chris Little. Well Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what proposals she has put to OFM-DFM for the cross-community sports programme announced as part of the OFM-DFM Building a United Community Strategy in May of this year? Well, I'm certainly looking at I mean, the £2 million that was secured in the last executive meeting will either happen through monitoring rounds or together built United Communities Funds, which looks at the Foyle Valley programme that my colleague Raymond McCartney raised. We're also looking at specific programmes around access for disabilities. And at the minute, we're talking to some of the sports bodies, but mainly through Sport NI, to look at the potential for others. I mean, I could quite happily spend every penny on that on sport. Uh, and you know, happy to do that. And I heard the member for fin or the minister for finance and personnel talking about the need for demands uh, and like in, needing to see projects that can be brought forward. Despite some of the rigid criteria that have been used in, in terms of access and that and other monies, I'm looking outside the box for potential and opportunities. And I believe sport, and certainly arts, but definitely sport, and particularly for access for people with disabilities, is one example that I believe that this house. We'll all join together and say it's money well spent. That concludes questions to the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure.
Point of order. Thank you very much. It's just seeking some clarity in relation to the topical questions and where a minister says that a question has already, going, already been tabled in the oral questions. Case in point today, Ian Mullen asked a question today about the terms of reference and the child abuse. The question number one was about how many meetings that the minister had with the Minister of Health. The questioner in topical questions can't assume, first of all, that the member will be in, in their place at the appropriate time, nor what the answer of the minister would be. And indeed, when the minister went on to subsequently answer the question to Ms. Fairn, he made no reference to the importance or what input the department would have in the terms of reference. So I think we have to be careful. Yes, we don't want duplication, but I think the ministers have to be careful that they, they also answer the question that they're asked. The member will know, of course, it's entirely up to the minister how he or she answers the question. Certainly, uh, the whole concept of topical questions is under review by, by the speaker. And I imagine at the next meeting we'll certainly talk about the absence of members who didn't turn up for topical questions. Yes. I have no issue with the minister who doesn't want to answer a question, but I don't think they can be permitted to say, I'm not answering that question, but I'll answer it in the oral questions, and then go on not to answer the question in oral questions. I don't think that can be permitted. Uh, as, as I said, uh, the member's views will be uh, con considered, and uh, of course we're striving to improve ways in which topical questions don't overlap with oral questions. And uh, I can assure you that the uh, speaker is giving a lot of detail uh, to that.